hairdresser named Mr. Phyllis. And um, I had some... His mother, his, mother, his mother wanted a girl, you know, and got her. But anyhow, <laughs> in spades. <laughs> so anyhow, so Mr. Phils, Mr. Phils and I are very close. Like, I don't know how much you know, but like, um, like, like we cut off my braids. Like, uh, we're like sisters, really, you know, intimate. And uh, so I just came back from working in Pittsburgh, so I decided to buy Mr. Phyllis a gift. So I decided to buy Mr. Phyllis a wig, so I wanted to get the wig wholesale. Like, you probably don't know this. I like see a wig in Wig City. It looks okey-dokey. But you don't know that wigs are bred on wig farms. And if you really are in, you go directly to the wig farm where all the wigs are running around. They're still alive when you pick out the one you want. And the wigs are running. And I wanted to get, like, a... I wanted to get a good wig. 10, 15 bucks. Oh, you know, I'll blow it. So, uh, so we go over to the wig farm, and, you know, we're looking around. They take us over to the wig pen. And different wigs... The wig pen. <laughs> Speak up, it's a small room. And, you know, different wigs are bred for different things. Some wigs are bred to curl, and some wigs are bred to fluff and to Marcel. And I want to get like a... You know, so I want to get like a nice wig for Mr. Phyllis, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and suddenly I spot really a stunning wig. A real knockout. It's long, blonde, silky hair, very, you know, wild, silky, good-looking wig. And I'm right about to say, that's it, when suddenly... Something begins to lick my hand. <laughs> and I look down, and it's the run to the litter. <laughs> how can you say no to a little cross-eyed wig who's just looking up at you with love in his eyes? And a love is missing you because of the crossed eyes, you know? <laughs> It had black roots and dandruff, you know, <laughs> bald spots. Like, you know, a loser wig, but you know, you know, that's it, right, you know. And I figured, like, I'll take it home, and with love, anything can be made pretty. You know, like my mother's always saying, even attractive girls get married. And so I'm... <laughs> she says that often. But anyhow, <laughs> cruel lady that she is. <laughs> So anyhow, so I take the wig home, and I went out, and I really wanted to do right by it, and I bought a book called Train You to Train Your Wig, and um, <laughs> I was going to send it to wig obedience school, but I couldn't afford that. It's, you know, <laughs> I don't want it to become a wash wig. I just wanted to... Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, and I went, I bought it wig food and wig bones, and I got... You should spoil a wig. Like a lot of people don't feed their wigs wig food. Like a lot of people say, like my wig. How many times your friend said to you, like my wig won't touch wig food. <laughs> yeah. My wig. What Harry and I eat, the wig eats. You know. <laughs> if it isn't chopped sirloin, the wig won't touch it. From Harry's mouth to the wig. <laughs> but I don't believe in this. If it's a wig, it should eat like good wig food. 59 cents a can, you know, good, but wig food. So I bought it the wig food and the little wig bones, and I would say to it things like, um, set! <laughs> <laughs> Curl! <laughs> Be a muff! <laughs> Be a muff for mommy! And nothing! <laughs> so I looked it up in the book, and the book said the reason the wig wasn't paying attention because it didn't have a name. Because, like, to get the most out of a wig, you got to give it a name. So I didn't know what to name it, like, what, you know, First, I didn't know, what do you name a wig? First of all, I didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. I was like, where do you look, you know? So, <laughs> so finally I named it Sydney. Because, like, uh, you can do anything with Sydney. You know? like, in England, boys, girls, everything's named Sydney, you know? So, <laughs> and I gave it to Mr. Phyllis, and tragedy struck. <laughs> yes, friends. Mr. Phyllis one day started to tease him, and it bit him. <laughs> Mr. Phyllis had a lot of tragedy, all because of me, too, which upsets me. Um, I had mentioned his name on the Johnny Carson show, and a lot of people really listen, you know, to what, you know, you say on the show. And I said, like, I have a hairdresser, Mr. Phyllis, and the very next day he got a lot of phone calls. Plus a couple of new customers. And he went to... And he was downstairs in the shop, you know, busy teasing and carrying on. And somebody... Somebody broke through his Tiffany glass.
glass door, uh, <laughs> broke into his apartment and stole all his valuables, including his roommate. And you know, <laughs> They thought it was a piece of pop art and just, you know, just... <laughs> That Andy Warhol's fantastic. You know? <laughs> the eyes move on this baby, you know. What I mean? <laughs> or a healer. And my father, uh, my father has a patient who's in the used car business. And my father saved this man's wife's life. And this man never forgot this. Or forgave my father. And he was like, I'll get you yet, Doc! Anyhow, so he got me. But I just, I lived in Westchester before I got my apartment. And I used to drive back and forth into the city and I needed a car desperately. So my father got this man to get me a second-hand Volks bus. And at first, I was just delighted, you know, because it only cost 400 new marks. And <laughs> it had only been driven on Sundays by a German family down to Argentina. So, and, so, so I'd be like, great. But then, like, little things about the Volks bus got me nervous, because every time we'd stop for a red light, people would try to get on. And I... <laughs> The car breaks down. I'm driving downtown to the club where I work, and it's 11.30 at night, and I'm on the West Side Parkway, and I'm all dressed up because I'm going to work, and I have my wig next to me in a box, you know, keep it fresh, and suddenly, the car stops. And for the women in the audience, it's frightening because if you've ever driven alone, you think like you're very smart while you're driving, you know, but suddenly, with the radio going, the flag's flying, but then... <laughs> Isadora Duncan, you know, at the window with the scarfs going. But, uh, <laughs> so, suddenly, your car stops dead. And you realize, here you are on the parkway. You know, here I was, you know, a girl alone. So I get out of the car, and nobody stops. They're going back and forth. And I take my wig with me, and I'm standing on the parkway, and I'm saying little things such as, um, Help! Help! Because <laughs> I don't fool around. And, uh, the wig is saying things like, uh, Help her! Help her! And nobody stops. And I'm really getting very frantic. And I'm waiting for help with both hands. And I drop the wig. And a guy drives over it. And I began to cry because there is $125 that now says Firestone. <laughs> And the guy's car screeches to a halt, and he jumps out and he said, I killed your dog. <laughs> he gives me $10 and he drives off. So, I, I want you to get the picture. It's 11.30 at night. It's raining out. I'm walking down the West Side Parkway against the traffic with a dead wig in my arms. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody stops. They're New Yorkers, they've seen it, you know? <laughs> Keep going, Shirley. She's filming a naked city. Yeah. <laughs> test and Marie's Digest, and that's what we are. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. How many times a week does your maid come in? Joan, how often are you home? Four. Four. <laughs> if I was living home, I'd be upper, upper, you know. But anyhow, yeah. so, um, so I brought my mother to see the apartment, and the first thing she says, like, um, she's like, anything can be made cheerful. Which, that hurts. Because <laughs> I already made it cheerful, I thought. And then... <laughs> Then I took Roy Silver Star Maker over, and he said, he said, well, when you paint, it'll be better, and they painted it. It's, it's been like bango time, you know? So anyhow, so I got this old broken-down candelabra, really lousy-looking, and I scraped it with the Brillo, and I got rid of all the wax and everything, and today I have a beautiful Chianti bottle. So okay. But, uh, but I have what they call black thumb. 
Because I had to have my bed. Bad luck with plants, and I bought me a philodendron. I started small, and I put it here. Yeah, I put it in my kitchen, and it drank my soup. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother said, like, to give you farm and building a little class, which we need desperately, I must say. Uh, my mother said, give it a name. Because every apartment building today has a name. Like on 10th Street, there's a Vincent Van Gogh. You, this, you know, my sister's getting married. She's moving to the Gentry East. It's north in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> the Brooklyn Gentry got to live, too, you know. <laughs> the Patty Maxine Laverne, you know. So I uh, understand uh, <laughs> the doormen all wear pompadours and do the, the, the taxi boogie. But anyhow. Uh, <laughs> so my mother said, give the building a name because the building doesn't have a name. And like, um, so I decided we should call a meeting a house meeting because that's important, you know. And we had to call a house meeting during the day because a lot of the ladies work in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> They're actresses also. <laughs> we all stand around in the foyer and we, <laughs> and we talk about things like ankle bracelets and wedgies, you know. And, uh, and they love me. But sometimes like, I live away, but like they take care of me in my apartment building, which is like, you know, which is nice. And, uh, I'm the newest tenant, and all the ladies are so good to me, and they worry. And, like, one of them tonight said to me, which is just, you know, so nice, she's like, you know, keep over 45th Street if you know what's good for you. <laughs> and I <laughs> <laughs> Top and nitties. But anyhow. <laughs> anyhow, so we decided, we got all together, we decided to give the house a name. And we had several alternatives. We could have called it the Jose. <laughs> then uh, somebody, somebody suggested the Mildred. <laughs> but I said no. And finally, finally we decided we have a simple name. We just call it Public Shelter. And it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and who's like, where do you live? You say, I live in the public shelter west. And, like, <laughs> and everybody suddenly, you ch when your building has a name, we're all different now. And we all walk tall through the lobby, you know? And we, we carry ourselves a lot of class. And now we walk over to the super and we say things like, call me a bus. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> Super says, you're a bus. <laughs> and then he wishes you well in a foreign tongue. But I have... <laughs> tell you a little bit about myself, because um, that starts it out nicely. I come from a little town called Larchmont, which is very, very tiny. We have a mirror at one end. And, um, and, 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 which scares hell out of the visitors. Crash out. And, uh, there's a bloody stranger. But then, uh, anyhow... My father is a doctor in Larchmont, and I'm, I'm very proud of my father. I think he's a, a lot smarter than a lot of these guys with degrees. And my father... Uh, uh, my, my, fa my father's like a true American dream. This is kind of interesting. My father worked his way through medical school as a waiter. <laughs> and to this day, little things kind of carry over into the practice. The minute a patient walks in the office, he gives him a roll and a glass of water. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the patients are you know, like, uh, gee, doc, uh, what have I got? My father says, what do you have, you know? And, uh, <laughs> he writes his prescriptions like this, you know? <laughs> Unless, if it's a family, he says, you want that all in one prescription, you know? And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, my mother, now, uh, going, my mother, it's very interesting, my mother is not a doctor even though she also didn't go to medical school. She's, like, 
she's just a mother, you know. And uh, we're very close. We're almost like mother and daughter. And, um, <laughs> and um, as a child, my parents were very good. I was very fat as a child. But, like, um, when you say fat, like, like, I was my own buddy of hands. Now, that's, you know. <laughs> and, uh, because... Because I was so fat, I didn't have any friends because nobody could get close enough to me to find out I was fun. So I would... <laughs> I began to retreat very much into my cells. And my parents... <laughs> my parents tried to cheer me up. You know, they'd go for a ride and they'd take me with them in the U-Haul. But even so... <laughs> because I used to sit around the sandbox and make death masks, you know. So they said that um, for protection, they better send me to progressive school. So they sent me to the Leonard Bernstein Country Day. <laughs> or Leonard Bernstein, depending on your income level. And, they, uh, <laughs> and at, at the school, do you know about progressive schools? Like, progressive schools are run on the theory of let the child do as he wishes. You know, let the child do as he wishes, you know, let the child do as he wishes. So for three years, I did not wish to go to school. And then, uh, tick, tick, tick. And then, uh, my, they caught me and they sent me to school. And because I was so fat, they thought the therapy, this is all true, folks. They thought, <laughs> it is, exaggerated but true. They, uh, grossly, they thought... <laughs> To let me forget that I was fat, they would put me into the school plays, you know, which would kind of, you know, take my mind off that lumber lumber. And <laughs> it was Christmas time, and they put me into the Christmas play, and the first part I ever had, I played the three magi. And um, <laughs> I got to do a solo. I three kings of Orient am. And then uh, <laughs> my family, and uh, this wasn't so tragic up to a few years ago, because there were three of us, see, that were single. There was a sister, a cousin, and me, and then uh, my, co my sister is getting married, which we'll talk about soon, and, she's, uh, and uh, she's marrying a Cuban, and my father is thrilled. He said, well, I gain a son, but I lose a tractor, and uh, but he's a Cuban doctor, and uh, we dressed him up and bought him a gold tooth. So anyhow, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, it, in Westchester, you do things differently, and we've been having, like, a lot of receptions going, and uh, you meet people on reception lines, and usually on a reception line, they'll say things to you, um, you know, if it's a wedding reception, it's like, this is Joan Rivers, how do you do, Joan Rivers, how do you do, Joan Rivers, how do you do, right. Well, in Westchester, they don't say your name, they say what you gave, and they say, like, <laughs> this is service for 12, how do you do, service for 12. <laughs> Coming, you know, gift coming. <laughs> gift coming just gets one hors d'oeuvre. But anyhow, so um, <laughs> the other single person, see, was my cousin. And um, my, co my cousin was never married, which is kind of interesting. She was 77 years old, never married. Fooled around, you know, but never married. <laughs> she, she went to a testimonial dinner for Geritol, met a, <laughs> met a guy 92 years old and they got married. They had to. So the whole family, <laughs> the whole family <laughs> was hysterical that she finally made it in the biblical sense. So my mother said, let's, uh, my mother said, let's give her a party. So we went to the hotel plaza and we all stood there and we toasted them in a glass of hot water and the juice of a lemon. And then, uh, the ambulance, we all lined up. <laughs> we threw rice and orthopedic shoes. And, you know, <laughs> and they had a two-week honeymoon at the Mayo Clinic, and it was nice. I hate to fly more than anything, and unfortunately, sometimes you have to fly in this business. And I was going out to do the Mike Douglas show, which is in Cleveland. 
And in order to do the Mike Douglas show, you have to fly to Cleveland. Because if you stay in New York and make faces in the mirror, they don't pay you. And, uh, you know, so I'm flying out to Cleveland, and I hate to fly, and I believe in omens. And I wake up that morning, and it's a blizzard. And I'm in the taxi going out to LaGuardia Airport. And I look out of my taxi window, and flying along with the taxi is a black albatross. <laughs> Whistling going my way. So, uh, <laughs> so we get to LaGuardia Airport, and by this time, it's really, it's a terrible blizzard. Terrible, terrible. And nobody's flying. My airlines is going. I said, like, what are you trying to prove? Don't go. I won't tell. I promise. And he's like, stop it. You know. And he's like, there's nothing to worry about. You know. And they give me a rabbit's foot and a cross. And, uh, <laughs> that's because I was going tourist. You know. The first class each got their own priest. So anyhow, so, <laughs> it pays to spend. And they take... <laughs> plane and the plane is parked in front of the hangar and even the plane looks afraid and it's got its wings folded over its nose <laughs> and on the side of the plane is the plane's name which is the flying titanic so all, <laughs> so, we're all standing there and we're all looking at the plane and there's a man standing right next to me also looking at the plane and he's saying things like um if God wanted man to fly, <laughs> he'd give him wings. And he's our pilot. So, uh, <laughs> which I should have guessed from the cape and the S. But anyhow. So, <laughs> so, he starts to load us on the plane. And we're going up the, what do you call it? The gangplank. Yeah, whatever they call it nowadays. So I use a negative cleverly, and I turn to the stewardess, and I said, like, there isn't enough room, is there? And she says, lots now of the rats have left. <laughs> so, <laughs> nobody loves a you-know-what, miss. So anyhow, so we get on the plane, and the stewardess sits us down, and she says Kaddish, and then... Uh, <laughs> She starts to give us her very her speech, and she's a very negative stewardess, you know. And instead of saying things like uh, "if we ditch," you know, she goes, uh, "When we ditch, <laughs> and the sharks come at ya, <laughs> kill them with a blunt instrument, <laughs> like your arm." <laughs> What sharks? What ditching? We're flying to Cleveland. <laughs> Check your atlas, you fool. <laughs> she goes over and she kicks the door shut from the outside. So, uh, <laughs> stewardesses hate women. Like the men of the like you don't know this because like, they're always dressed up in those little uniforms. But like I uh, <laughs> They're very nice. To the men, they're always saying things like, you know, coffee, tea, or what will you, sir? But to the women, they're like super polite, you know. And, um, you, know just, and you can't blame them, though, because they're all single. And they fire them at 26. They have a definite deadline. You know? They don't fool around. So our, our stewards are like all over the men. And uh, I was saying little things to her like, um, excuse me, uh, uh, have you got a throw-up bag? And uh, <laughs> She says it's not my aisle. And, uh, 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 she was so rotten. Our stu she sold me a magazine. Now, and somebody had colored it. So, uh, so anyhow, we blow into Cleveland an hour ahead of schedule because we're on the tail end of this hurricane. And the airlines did not know what to do with this because it had never happened in their history that anyone even came in near schedule. So they got together for a conference and to kill time, they put us through customs. I, I think pets are important. And I think like, everybody 
because you have a pet, but I don't think uh, you should overlove a pet. And uh, we have neighbors on the left called Levine, or uh, Levine, because they just went into a higher income bracket. But, uh, <laughs> suddenly they realized they were French all along. But anyhow. <laughs> so anyhow, so they have a chihuahua, but originally they had a little boy named Ronnie. And, uh, <laughs> mothers you know, had like a very difficult time giving birth to the son, you know, like just ask her. It's like, you know, 25 years later, she's still timing the contractions, you know, these kind of mothers. You, know, you go to borrow a cup of sugar, you know, you say, yeah, have you got a cup of sugar, Mrs. Levine? You know, she's like, every seven minutes. <laughs> child, the Levine slash Levines, lavished him with affection. You know, anything Ronnie wanted, Ronnie got, you know, like, sacrifice, sacrifice, a chicken a week, you know, and, and, <laughs> and everything Ronnie had, Mrs. Levine took and dipped in bronze. <laughs> and put on a bracelet, you know, and you should say, like, this is Ronnie's baby shoe, I had it dipped in bronze, and this is Ronnie's skate key, I had it dipped in bronze, <laughs> this is Ronnie's maternity pin, I had it dipped in bronze, and this is Ronnie, and he'll never leave me. <laughs> And Mrs. Levine 
would say to the head waiter things like, table for five. <laughs> and Sonny was so ashamed, he'd shaken double time. <laughs> it isn't pretty, folks. <laughs> this is a chihuahua cry at Howard Johnson's. <laughs> cherry vanilla. <laughs> well, this is hard to believe. <laughs> this very morning, this very morning, Wednes, or Thurs, <laughs> we were busy yesterday, this very morning, Thurs, Mrs. Levine picked up a princess to tell my mother. <laughs> it's happened all over again, full circle. Sonny has run off with a Siamese cat. <laughs> tragedy strike, folks. Uh, my dog has become an alcoholic. And that's, uh, it's, yeah, it's not, it's very sad. We had a dog. Uh, it's all because of the water shortage, I'll explain, but we had a dog who, like, never touched liquor. But, uh, you know, on New Year's Eve, she'd take a bite of celery, but that was it. And, you know, uh, she had, like, she, <laughs> she lived by the motto, you know, muzzle that touched liquor will never touch mine. Nothing. And she didn't go near St. Bernard's. The whole, very straight nice. Then, <laughs> The water shortage starts, and in Westchester, they said, like, nobody should water their lawns with water. So my father said, why not? Because, you know, we obey the law. So he goes out, and he's watering with beer. And uh, <laughs> two acres full of beer. The weeping willow got the giggles. You know. <laughs> Every time, the, you know, the gardener would walk past, you know, get your hands off, Tony. The whole place got wild. And uh, <laughs> the dog chewed grass. And she liked it, and it got very cute because she was like a tipsy Airedale. And Frizz was like cute to see, because she like run around, she'd laugh, you know, hit him, Mr. Hydra, what the hell. I'm like, this not cute, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> we'd say things to him like, you know, go fetch your dog, go fish him. <laughs> you win or you get it. And then, she turned nasty. And she began to hang around with like bad kinds of people. She began to hang around with police dogs and she'd go into bars for free drinks. Ugly. And uh, one day she kind of like wandered off and coming, this is hard to believe. <laughs> coming here tonight, we stopped. I laugh because it's so emotional. We stopped, we stopped at the Bowery for a red light. And would you believe my dog came out of the shadows and for drink money licked off my windshield? 